So the, the amazing book of Ezekiel, and we'll start with chapter 1, but before that, I need to give you some general information. Some of those pieces of information you all are aware of, and some of those might be new to you. So for us to you know understand better the book of Ezekiel, first of all, it's interesting, the name, the meaning of the name of that prophet. The name Ezekiel means God strengthens. And indeed, that's very applicable to this prophet, because Ezekiel had tenacity, internal strength to perform God's will. Not many people would be able to endure what he did. Remember, he was lying on one side and then later on another side for days. In fact, on one side he was lying for a whole year, over one year. So he had tenacity, internal strength to perform God's will, which is very amazing. Now, in Ezekiel chapters 5 and chapter in chapter 4, there were four symbolic acts that Ezekiel had to perform, brethren. The first act was he had to portray siege on a tile for all to see. The second symbolic act was he had to lie on his side. The third symbolic act was he had to lose his wife and not mourn. And the fourth one was he had to eat an unusual diet. So you see from all this, you know, he had an amazing internal strength to perform God's will. And no wonder that his name means God strengthens. Now the second point in this over, overview of Ezekiel is found in Ezekiel chapter 24 and verse 24 because there was a sign to you. Thus Ezekiel is a sign to you, God says. Ezekiel 24, 24. Thus Ezekiel is a sign to you. According to all that he has done, you shall do. And when this comes, you shall know that I am the Lord God. So he was a sign that they would, as it says in chapter 6 and verse 7, you should, that they shall know that I am the Lord. And also in chapter 2, verse 5, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. So, brethren, he was a sign so that the house of Israel, as it says in Ezekiel 6, 7, would know that he is the Lord. This phrase, and you shall know that I am the Lord, is mentioned 30 times in this book. And also that for them, that they would know that a prophet has been among them, so that they will know that God was working through prophet Ezekiel. And I would say the same is true probably for us, as we preach various things that are going to come to pass. When, you know, they happen, even though the rebellious house of Israel, modern house of Israel, refuses to uh, accept God's word and God's prophecies, when it does happen, and when the remnant of Israel remains in that captivity, they will know that a prophet, Dr. Thiel, of course, was among them, and that uh, we others were also giving them the prophecies, sure words of the Bible. Now, Ezekiel's job was and is twofold, brethren, and I would say this also applies to us as well. The twofold, the first, we can say, aspect of his job was to strengthen the nation after it was crushed by the Assyrians, the nation meaning the house of Israel, the ten tribes, and then by Babylonians, the house of Judah. And the second aspect of his work was to prepare the people to eventually return to their promised land. And as you know, they will return to their promised land in that great second exodus that we mentioned quite often. It's one of the pivotal teachings of the Bible. We need to understand that one and again, there is a sermon I delivered to you on the subject, so you can always review it if you need to. And those who need a link, let me know and I'll send it to you. Now, the very book of Ezekiel covers prophecies over a 22 years period. So from 593 until 571 before Christ. It deals with fall of Judah, the captivity of Judah and the restoration of that nation. But many prophecies as we have seen last Sabbath, are specifically dated. There are 14 revelations from God in the book of Ezekiel, the introduction, and 13 specific prophecies. So we have 14 revelations, the introduction, and 13 specific prophecies. And among within those prophecies, seven prophecies concerning Judah and Israel, six prophecies are concerning Gentile nations, and one prophecy is about the millennium dealing with the new temple in Jerusalem. And we'll go into the detail of that new temple in due time. 
Now there is also an interesting chronology line that we mentioned last Sabbath, because not all prophecies of Ezekiel are chronological. Some are backtracking. In the case of chapters 1 through 3, those three chapters speak about call and commission of Ezekiel. Chapter 4 through 24, they are actually dealing with the time before complete fall of Judah has already started. So Ezekiel was in captivity. He was basically for a decade a prisoner of war before Judah finally fell. The demise of the nation of Judah, as you know, began uh, about 19 years before the final fall. And then it was gradually that nation and the land was gradually disintegrated over the span of 19 years. Ezekiel was 10 years into captivity before the final fall of Judah and Jerusalem. Then chapters 25 through 32, Gentile nations are mentioned in those chapters and you might remember that the three prophecies are actually related to Egypt. We'll go through all of them, of course, verse by verse. And finally, chapters 33, when he was appointed the uh, watchman over the house of Israel, through chapter 48, those are millennial prophecies. Millennial prophecies, so a good portion of the uh, book of Ezekiel is really about the coming future. Uh, chapter 48, I'll remind you, is actually speaking about the remnant of Israel that will return to the promised land and the land will be redistributed again among the uh, tribes of Israel. Now, something also speaking of chronological outline, what we need to notice, we need to notice uh, three basically mentioned dates. You remember the book of Ezekiel is very specific because he does mention the day, the month, and the year when he got the revelations from God or the and he was of course to convey them to the people and to prophesy and write down those prophecies. So we need to know that in, Z, in Ezekiel chapter 26 verse 1, in Ezekiel chapter 29 verse 1, in Ezekiel 29 17 and chapter 30 20 we have you know uh, certain dates that are mentioned. In chapter 26 verse 1 it is the 11th year in chapter 29, verse 1, it is the 10th year. In chapter 29, verse 17, it jumps to the latest date. And in chapter 30, verse 20, it continues its sequence. Now, the book of Ezekiel, as you might have appreciated, brethren, is uh, also basically divided into two parts. The first part is chapters 1 through 24. And the main theme in, uh, in those chapters is doom. Doom and destruction. However, from chapter 25, the second part starts in chapter 25 and runs through chapter 48. That's the second part of the, this book. And the second theme of the book is consolation. Consolation because, you know, in the end, regardless of all the sufferings and the great tribulation and the horrible bondage coming upon the house of Israel, the end is that the remnant will be delivered, the house of Israel will be restored to its promised land, and of course the eternal life will be offered to the house of Israel, not only to the house of Israel, but also to all the other nations, because the house of Israel will be the model nation for all the others to follow. Now, being God's prophet is not easy. I'm sure Dr. Thiel can tell you about that, tell us about that, that is. And he does because, you know, he does, he does cause all kinds of false accusations and uh, people not understanding and people trying to belittle you and so on. Well, that's nothing new under heaven. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 5, you can, we can read this verse and we can see how being God's prophet is not easy because this verse says, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. So, you know, brethren, this verse describes what it is to be God's prophet. You know, this is the most difficult aspect of that office. And the image of eating God's word means that, you know, God's prophets must internalize it and they have to bring message of lamentations and woe, which is, of course, not very easy and not everybody is able to have that kind of commission. That's why God specifically chose Ezekiel. In our time, in the Church of God, God specifically chose Dr. Thiel. And here we are all to pray for him and for his success as he is doing his utmost to reach all all the nations around the world with the gospel message and of course we are all behind it and we are doing our part
and thankfully with this warning that we have just uh, uh, as we have edited and uh, prepared this article about Halloween for this year we have done also our great part brethren we are going to warn millions of people of how satanic that terrible celebration is in just a few hours in your Anglo-Saxon world now another verse that needs to draw our attention it is found in the book of Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 16 Again, you know, being God's prophet is not easy. That's the point. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16. Habakkuk writes, When I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Well, this is a reaction of knowing what is to happen. In Revelation chapter 10, Verse 8 through 10, the Apostle John was inspired to write, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Well, we have the imagery of eating word means that it is bitter to take. But the news in the long run is good. So again, you know, being God's prophet is not easy. And uh, we need to appreciate that, especially as we need to keep Dr. Thiel in our prayers, as he is also spreading that word and also teaching us uh, all that God's word has for us. Now, Ezekiel is a man. It's an interesting personality. His bi biography is no less interesting because as prophet Ezekiel was respected indeed in his community you might remember that in chapter 33 we read how the people not god god later of course also appointed him a watchman but the people themselves appointed him a watchman but in ezekiel chapter 8 verse 1 we see that wonderful reputation he enjoyed in his community ezekiel 1 8 verse 1 it says and it came to pass in the sixth year in the sixth month of the fifth day of the month as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. So you see, Ezekiel had a house, but he could not move about freely. And for that reason, the elders sat before him, and he also had a certain dumbness that God used. You might remember that he was dumb for a while, for seven days, and the people sat waiting for him to speak, and he only spoke what God said. Related to that, please go to Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 25. Ezekiel says, So I spoke to those in captivity of all the things the Lord had shown me. So by this state, you know, he was able to speak freely, but only when God opened his mouth. Then in chapter 14, verse 1, Ezekiel says, Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. So you see, he gave advice to the elders. Well, no wonder he was a priest. And in chapter 20, verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So you see, elders came to Ezekiel to inquire of the Lord. Now, as a man, Ezekiel had great love for his people. And in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 8, we can see that great love. He says, Ezekiel 9, 8, that is, So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone, and I fell on my face and cried out and said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? You see, we see in this picture Ezekiel crying, pleading with God not to destroy all the nation of Israel. In chapter 11, verse 13, it says, Now it happened while I was prophesying that Pelethia, the son of Benaiah, died. Then I fell on my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, Lord God, will you make a complete end of the remnant of Israel? So you see, he fell down and cried for the people. So he had a great love for his people Israel. And indeed, I do share that same love with him. And we all should, brethren, share the same love with Ezekiel for the house of Israel and, of course, for the entire all humanity. When I say the house of Israel, I keep in mind that all humanity... All the nations will be grafted into Israel and therefore will be saved. So uh, that's the love we need to share for, for our peoples. And that's exactly what it's the second greatest commandment. One is to love God with our strength, all of our strength and all of our mind and soul. And the other is to love your neighbors as yourself. 
Now, it might be interesting to you that there were some contemporaries of Ezekiel, because, you know, when we see who his contemporaries were, we might actually have a better grasp of the Bible teachings. Uh, somebody did mention, I think last, uh, or, or over the course of this week, he never realized that Ezekiel was contemporary with Daniel. Well, yes, indeed. Because you remember, when the house of Judah fell into the hands of the Babylonians, Daniel was taken captive along with the house of Judah. So therefore, the two of them had to be contemporaries. So Ezekiel was contemporary with Daniel because the book of Ezekiel comprises one-third of the major prophets. And Daniel, I'll remind you, brethren, was a librarian at the Babylonian National Library. And therefore, uh, the Babylonians had a habit of uh, taking writings, scrolls, uh, literature of all the nations which they conquered, which means that the scrolls containing, you know, the uh, Holy Scriptures were also there at the Babylonian National Library. So uh, the prophet Daniel was able to read them, was able to interpret them, and he was also able to uh, canonize them, to get them together. So he, was, he took part in canonization of the Old Testament. Now Daniel is also, uh, unlike the other prophets, you know, Daniel is uh, classified as writings writing section of the Bible. You may wonder why, I'll just remind you, because unlike other prophets who prophesy about the house of Israel and the house of Judah, Daniel does prophesy about the whole world. The major focus of Daniel's wor work and Daniel's book is restoration of the whole earth, restoration of the government of God over the earth, and establishment of the kingdom of God. And therefore, that's why he is not really classified as a prophet. He is in the writing section of the Bible. And the book of Ezekiel, again, comprises one-third of the major prophets. Now, interesting enough, in Jewish order of the Bible, minor prophets, those 12 minor prophets, they come right after Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was also given an office of prophet, which is one of the church role, as we know, from Ephesians chapter 4. But God also has given some to be you know, prophets in his church. That's what we have recently discovered and restored in the Philadelphia remnant of God's church. So uh, we don't need to spend more time on that. We know that Dr. Thiel has got this role of a prophet. Perhaps God will raise perhaps more. We don't really know and it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we are all on the same page when it comes to understanding, brethren, and that we are all humble before God, humbly serving him and participating with all of our might into this end time, very end time work of God. Now, Daniel's office was more a servant. You know, Daniel was basically in a civil sector. He had an office of the state or secular offices, so to speak. While, meanwhile, Ezekiel's, you know, Ezekiel's uh, office was to be a prophet to the house of Israel. And since he couldn't deliver his message to the ancient house of Israel, that means that his message remains for the modern house of Israel. Ezekiel has been long dead, brethren, which means that... We can only continue that office. We can only continue that commission. Otherwise, there is nobody who can do it. And that's another reason why I mentioned to you in the beginning of this message. That's one of, one of the reasons why God raised his church in Jerusalem in 31 AD. And that's why one, another main reason why today, mark this, God, why today God has called each one of us brethren into his church. Now, how amazing is that? And how wonderful is that? Let's take a look at some dating as well, just to help us you know, understand this book better. Uh, when it comes to dating, uh, our attention should be focused on 2 Chronicles chapter 34, where Judah renewed covenant with God. That was 60, 622 before Christ. It was a jubilee year. 2 Chronicles 34 verse 31 it says, Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. So this is Judah and one of those righteous kings. If you take a look at the... Uh, a list of the kings of Israel and uh, in, 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 in the book of Kings and the book of uh, and, uh, and, and other historical writings in the Bible, you'll find that basically all the Israelitish kings were evil. 
it was only a few kings from the house of Judah who reigned from Jerusalem that were righteous. So in this year, this was 622 before Christ, Judah renewed covenant with God. It was a jubilee year. And then in 2 Kings chapter 24, we, you don't have to go there, but uh, I'll just tell you that we see that the nation of Judah lost its status in stages. As I said, over the course of 19 years, they kept gradually losing the status of being a nation before they were completely subdued by 604 before Christ. The tribe of Dan was in captivity, the entire tribe of Dan. And by winter of the same year, the surrounding nations around Judah, they submitted to Nebuchadnezzar. And then in 2 Kings chapter 24 and in verse 12, we read that the king and Jehoiada gave it to those who did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and they hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also those who worked in iron and bronze to restore the house of the Lord. Well, Jehoiachin, the king Jehoiachin, was taken captive in 597 before Christ in the 12th month of that year. So the 12th month of 597, he was taken captive. However, Ezekiel was taken captive in the ninth month of that year, 597. So this was still not the last king, because the last king, King Sedekiah, the last king of Judah, he was the last Jewish king, he was taken captive in the year 587 before Christ. Which again tells us that Ezekiel was captive 10 years before the final demise of the Jewish nation and the final fall of Jerusalem and the total destruction of the temple that stood in Jerusalem. In, in verse 1 in chapter 1 of Ezekiel, uh, we all you know, I think we're getting familiar with that, with that verse very much because even some of us are coming with uh, great musical talents and are composing even a tune to these words. And I'm very happy to see that, brethren. I'm so excited to see uh, how the Holy Spirit keeps moving us in the right direction. In chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month of the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. Well, mark this, this verse 1. You can write it on, 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 on the margin of your Bible. And again, I know I, I'm perhaps boring, but I'll keep repeating that, brethren. The Bible should be our textbook. It's not to be like, you know, clear margin and... Uh, without any wrinkles. No, brethren, the Bible is a textbook. The Bible, the book itself is not holy. What is written in the book is holy. Please keep that in mind. So it's not an object that we should venerate. The Bible should be our textbook. So feel free to use those margins and write various notes and, and, and notifications and uh, observations. It's important and it will enhance greatly your Bible study. So anyway, what is important for this verse one, you can jot, jot down in your Bible. This, this was the 30th year of Jubilee cycle and renewal of covenant, which happened in July 593 before Christ. So this was the 30th year of Jubilee cycle and renewal of covenant, which happened in July 593 before Christ. Now this also began a 40 year period of testing for God's people. Because keep this in mind, Jehoiachin, the next to the last king of Judah, he was in the fifth year of captivity. So Ezekiel uses this to date most of his prophecies. And there are also, there are two of his prophecies in which he no longer uses this way to date. In Ezekiel chapter 33 and 40, we find that there were two kings in Babylonian captivity. The one was Jehoiachin, and the other one was the last Jewish king, Zedekiah. And in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 21, we read that, in, in, And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, of the fifth day of the month that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been captured. So you see, Ezekiel dates his prophecies from the time of his own captivity, not from the captivity of the Jewish kings. Now Ezekiel was also taken captive by Babylonians three months earlier than Jewish king Jehoiachim. 
okay? So he fell as a prisoner of war three months earlier. Then that king, Jehoiakim, was deposed by the Babylonians. And then Zedekiah was appointed. And then later came, of course, the uh, complete... Ten years later came the uh, basically complete fall of the house of Judah. Now, of course, it's interesting to know what is Ezekiel's background, you know. Part of his biography, you might say. Well, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel... Uh, as you see, Jeremiah is also one of those uh, great major prophets. And of course, we will go through the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I'll remind you, was appointed to be the uh, basically the watchman and prophet for to the house of Judah. While Ezekiel, at the same time, was appointed to be the watchman and prophet for the house of Israel. Now, they were, not only were they... Uh, not only were they contemporaries, because again, think logically. Jeremiah was there to warn the house of Judah of its impending gloom and impending fall. Ezekiel was taken captive during the gradual fall of you know, ten, 10 years before Jerusalem fell. So the two of them had to be contemporaries. Daniel was taken captive when Jerusalem finally fell. So Daniel had to be their contemporaries as well. So, you know, just we need to use common sense sometimes to uh, connect various dots. At the same time, I have to remind you, especially you younger ones who are skillful with Internet, uh, you have even, we have succinct biographies of all those prophets, even on Wikipedia, would you believe that? All that you need to do in Google, just, you know, type Prophet Jeremiah and you'll get the most basic biographical data on Prophet Jeremiah or Prophet Ezekiel or Prophet Daniel. It is amazing what is there out there, what is all available to our knowledge. So we, you know, sometimes when we are in doubt, so we need some information rather than wondering where to find it. Well, try to find it with Google, you know, try to Google it out. You will be surprised how much information is there. And we are living in the last days and Daniel prophesied that the knowledge will increase in the last days. So here we are. Now, Ezekiel's background, again, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel are descendants of priestly line. And that may tell you something, because not all you know, the prophets were descendants of priestly line. That may tell you that they were also related, brethren. So they were not only contemporaries, but they were all, they're also distantly related. Because in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 3, Ezekiel says, The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest the son of Buzi, in the land of Chaldeans by the river Cheber, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So Jeremiah was of the priestly line, so was Ezekiel. They are related. Now Ezekiel's book also ha has strong influence of priesthood. We don't really find much in chapters 8 through 11. We don't much about the... Uh, you know, until chapter 8, we don't much about the priests, but from chapter 8 through 11, there is sanctuary discussed in those chapters. And then in chapters 40 through 48, these chapters speak about the new temple. So, uh, you know, that's the strong influence of priesthood and the role of priesthood is there. No wonder, because Ezekiel was of a priestly line. The priestly line, of course, which remained faithful to, to God. These days, we're also dealing with canon. That's also part of our focus. So the book of Ezekiel, this book was subject of antilegomia. <laughs> what is antilegomia? Well, it's people wondering whether a book should be in the Bible. <coughs> so yes, people wonder whether the book of Ezekiel should have been part of the Bible canon. Why? <laughs> well, it was questioned concerning doctrinal problems and because the temple at the end did not fit with earlier temple. But brethren, everything is okay because Ezekiel is talking about the coming millennial temple, not the one that existed before that. People fail to realize that, of course, because they don't believe in Bible prophecy and they think that the Old Testament is an antique book given uh, to antique people and has no relevance for us today whatsoever. Now, speaking of times, you might be also interested to see, you remember when we went through the uh, through those uh, lectures about the identity of Israel, you might remember that we had those 2,520 years 
of punishment, meaning that the material blessings and the dominance over the world was not given to the house of Israel or to the basically to the holders of the birthright, Ephraim and Manasseh, when they were in the promised land. In fact, that, as you remember, that promise was postponed for 2,520 years because of the sins which they committed in the promised land. So, as the punishment, they got dispersed, they lost their identity, but nevertheless, God had to fulfill that promise, and they became, at the beginning of the 19th century, they began to rise to power. So, there are 360 days in a prophetic year, and according to the biblical day for a year principle, when we multiply 360 days by 7, it equals 2,520. Now, we find that principle, you know, a day day for a year in Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, and also in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. Now, in view of that principle, we have the period from 604 before Christ, when Judah fell and was basically conquered, through 1917 AD, when British took the promised land from the Ottoman Empire, and Jewish soldiers fought with them, and the land passed to Israeli administration. When you add 604 plus 1917, you get 2,521. Since there is no zero year, we add one, so it is still 2,520 years. Also, Ezekiel's last prophecy, chapter 40, also contains a principal day for a year. We will see that when we read that chapter, that... 573 times 7 equals 1948. That year, 1948, began the modern state of Israel. The Jewish state was thus restored in the promised land. Also, in Jeremiah chapter 20, uh, 52, verse 1, we read about the king Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, that was taken captive by the Babylonians. The Zedekiah was 21 year old, years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. Now Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, was placed over Judah on January 15th, 588 before Christ, which was the beginning of siege of Jerusalem. And you remember that Ezekiel was to lie on one side and to portray that siege of Jerusalem. Historian Josephus, the famous historian Josephus, refers to Ezekiel in his Antiquities, in Book 10, Chapter 8, and Paragraph 20. There are several references there, but these two are most important. One is now in this one, Paragraph 20, Chapter 8, Book 10. It says, As Jeremiah and Ezekiel had foretold to him, Zedekiah, that he should be caught and brought before the king of Babylon, and should speak to him face to face, and should see his eyes with his own eyes. And uh, thus far did Jeremiah prophesy. But he was also made blind and brought to Babylon, but did not see it according to the predictions of Ezekiel. Also in the same book, Antiquities, in uh, that will be book 10, chapter 7, paragraph 2, speaks again about Ezekiel. So Josephus says, Now Zedekiah was twenty and one years old when he took the government and had the same mother with his brother Jehoiakim, that's the same king, that the, 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 the next to the last king, the one who went into captivity before him, but was a despiser of justice, speaking of Zedekiah, and of his duty, for truly those of the same age with him were wicked about him, and the whole multitude did what unjust and insolent things they pleased, for which reason the prophet Jeremiah came often to him and protested to him and insisted that he must leave off his impieties and transgressions and take care of what is right and neither give ear to the rulers among whom were wicked men nor give credit to their false prophets who deluded them as if the king of Babylon would make no more war against them and as if the Egyptians would make war against him and conquer him since what they said was not true and the events would not prove such as they expected. Now as to Zedekiah himself while he heard the prophet speak, he believed him and agreed to everything is true and supposed it was for his advantage. But then his friends perverted him and dissuaded him from what the prophet advised 
and ob obliged him to do what they pleased. Ezekiel also foretold in Babylon what calamities were coming upon the people, which when he heard, he sent accounts of them unto Jerusalem. But Zedekiah did not believe their prophecies for the reason following. It happened that the two prophets agreed with one another in what they said as to all other things, that the city should be taken and Zedekiah himself should be taken captive. But Ezekiel disagreed with him and said that Zedekiah should not see Babylon, while Jeremiah said to him that the king of Babylon should carry him away thither in bonds. And because they did not both say the same thing as to this circumstance, he disbelieved what they both appeared, appeared to agree in, and condemned them as not speaking truth therein, although all the things foretold him did come to pass according to their prophecies, as we shall show upon a fitter opportunity. That's, that was the quote from Josephus. So, of course, brethren, the both prophecies were right. The prophets only prophesied about two separate but related events, you know. Remember, line upon line, verse upon verse, Little here, little there. So, there is no discrepancy in the Bible. Not at all. Now, there are two sections in the Bible that I just want to mention this as a general information, as the last piece of that. That there are some mystics, you might say, biblical mystics. <laughs> Sounds very strange, but yes, there are people like that. There are people who just love mysticism. They just love to mysticize things away, you know. They... You show them something in clear light, but you know the, the 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 plain and clear facts don't seem to ring the bell with them. You know they always think that there is something mystical behind it. There is something hidden. That there is something you know that is not seen at first glance. That's why you see the explosion of occultism in our day and age because people just you know they just think that there is always something behind, something uh, hidden and secret. So there are two sections in the Bible that biblical mystics focus on. They focus on Ezekiel 1, where God's throne is described. They also focus on Isaiah chapter 6, which is another description of God's throne. So from those two sections, those mystics conjure up all kinds of interpretations. Well, in my view, they're wasting their time, but what can you do? There are people who just waste this precious time, brethren. Meanwhile, there are wonderful truths that we need to know and learn about the Bible. So, again, that was the general information about, about Ezekiel. Now, about the book of Ezekiel. There are a few other facts that will help us understand the book. One is that Ezekiel was among the early captives of Babylonians during the course of the fall of the kingdom of Judah. And everything written down in the book of Ezekiel is a message that was never really delivered to the ancient house of Israel. Speaking of Israel, that doesn't mean the house of Judah, but the ten lost tribes that were taken captive by the Assyrians 128 years before Ezekiel began writing his book. Ezekiel, however, was not in a position to carry his message to now lost house of Israel, which was no longer settled in the promised land. Because of all these factors, it is easy to see and understand that Ezekiel is a prophet for our times and for the current house of Israel. Ezekiel also had a wife at home. His wife died nine years after he began writing his book. He was unable to speak. He was mute and God opened his mouth and otherwise he could not speak. Ezekiel also never took his message to the handful of Jewish captives at the time he was writing his book. This book, brethren, was not written for those ancient Jews either. This book is for our time today. And since we are living in the very end times, how much relevant it is for our time today. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, as well as Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4, they all fill us uh, with, they fill us in what it is like at the throne of God. Revelation 1 shows Christ in image of God. So, this leads us to a very interesting fact, which is that Paul, Ezekiel, and Moses saw God. Now, you might, might say, how, how did Paul remember in his message to Corinthians, he speaks of a man who was in the third heaven. What is situated on the third heaven? 
it is the throne of God. And he said that he heard things that some of them he could not even write and he could not even speak of. He heard marvelous things. So yes, he was there and God, he saw God, you see, the Apostle Paul. Ezekiel obviously saw God, we're going to see now in a minute, he saw the throne of God, and Moses certainly spoke to God face to face, he was the friend of God. So, you see, no more than a handful of men have seen God. Ezekiel probably saw God's throne as much or more than any other man. That makes him very specific, because he was one of the few to whom God chose to show his appearance. What a privilege. And this is dealing with visions rather than literal transportation. Chapter 1, brethren. Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, of the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the real Cheber, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Cheber, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Then I looked, and behold, by the way, I'm reading from the New King James. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with a raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness, brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber, out of the midst of fire. Verse 5. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Well, brethren, these creatures he is describing here are cherubim. Or cherubim, however you pronounce it. God, want, God wants us to visualize what he is like. No, the details are not given, of course. And we know some things about God, but not others. You know, it will help us to pray if we understand presence of God indeed. Ezekiel was in the presence of God. We must know where we are when we pray. We are at the presence of, you know, God on his throne. Verse 6. Each one of those four creatures had four faces, and each one had four wings. Now, cherubim or cherubim are described by God as beautiful. Indeed, brethren, Lucifer was a covering cherub in the past. Keep that in mind. Now we see, you know, there is one head and four faces. So we might say it's four faceted heads. It is a class of spirit beings called cherubim. There is also another class of angels, which is an archangel or archangel, as we usually pronounce it, archangel or super cherubim. There are two super cherubims, Michael and Gabriel, there in this category of super cherubims or archangels. We also remember that there, you know, there is, there are, there is a cherubim sit at Garden of Eden to guard. There is also a cherub on the Ark of the Covenant, when he is always, you know, as he is portrayed there on the Ark of the Covenant. Interesting enough, you know, pagan worship of idols, brethren, usually involves representations of half-man and half-beast creatures. What comes to my mind, for example, right now is the famous Greek deity, the god Pan. Pantheism, the term pantheism came from that god Pan, you know. He is half-human and half-goat. Half so, pagan worship of idols usually involves, not always, but usually involves representations of half men and half beast creatures. You know, verse 10 in this chapter provides us a general knowledge of what cherub looked like. You know, they're beautiful creatures to each other. They have like human bodies, legs are described, but those legs don't function as ours do because they are spirit energy. They are majestic creatures that transport the throne of God. Verse 7. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calf's feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Now their wings, verse 9, touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, 
but each one went straight forward. Verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side, each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. Verse 11. Thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward, two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. Verse 12. And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. Verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. Verse 14. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Verse 15. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. Verse 16. The appearance of the wheel and the workings was like the color of burial, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now, burial, brethren, B-E-R-Y-L, actually means gyroscopic. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but gyroscopic, a gyroscope, you can Google it out. It is a device used for measuring or maintaining orientation and angular velocity. So, it is a spinning wheel or disc in which the axis of rotation is free to assume any orientation by itself. Well, brethren, simply put, Ezekiel saw wheels within wheels. This is a principle in spiritual application. Verse 17, when they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. Now, you know, those creatures were awesome, which is a good modern word, modern term that aptly describes the cherubim. In the old English translation, in the old King James, you'll find it says that they, you know, that the creatures were dreadful, <laughs> which now in our time and age has a different connotation. But the actual meaning is indeed awesome. You know, when it says their rims were full of eyes, it refers to portholes, to windows, you see. Verse 19. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Well, this vision appeared to Ezekiel, brethren, as he was on earth. Then in verse 20, he says, Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, because... There the Spirit went, and the wheels were lifted together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Verse 21. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Verse 22. The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. Now again, you know, the crystal was awesome indeed, not terrible as it says in the King James Version. So it's, you know, it's awesome. Everything around God's throne is awesome. So Ezekiel saw a sea of crystal, awesome crystal. You might remember the new song being sung in the book of Revelation on what appeared to be a sea of crystal. Of course, that was the new song before the throne of God. Verse 23, and under, e and under the firmament, their wings spread out straight, one toward another, and one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard, verse 24, the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army, and when they stood still, they let down their wings. 
Well, brethren, the throne of God is not always in the same spot. Spirit beings can move it at least 186,000 miles per second, which is around 300,000 kilometers per second, as fast as the speed of light. Now, of course, those spiritual creatures, however, are not limited to the speed of light. Now, we mentioned, I think, last Sabbath, we, we mentioned UFOs, as he was telling us very important and good things about the project of the Nazi Germany. And we have all heard, I think, of UFOs. And well, in fact, you know, they were mentioned, as I said, during our fellowship last Sabbath. Well, you see, in the Worldwide Church of God in the last century, there was an, inter there was an interpretation that UFOs may be manifestations of cherub rather than invaders from outer space or aliens, or that they may be spirit manifestations. They also may be satanic manifestations because they are beyond physical laws. And Satan, don't forget, is a cherub as well. So that was the interpretation of the old WCG. I wanted to share that with you. That it might be that those might be manifestations, whether perhaps those are the cherubims or it might be the satanic manifestations, Satan trying to, of course, lead people into deception. Verse 25. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. Verse 26. And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Well, you see, appearance of a man is actually Yahweh seated on the throne of God. Verse 27, And from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Well, the appearance of fire is a self-contained light source, you know. Verse 28, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Well, you see, the glory of the Lord has brilliant hues of spectrum refracting light like a rainbow over God's throne. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. 